the Blood Dragons, formerly known as the Order of the Blood Dragon and the Ordo Draconis, were a fearsome order of blood knights known for their peerless martial prowess in battle. They were consummate warriors whose skill at arms was unmatched in the old world, living only for martial combat and brutal battle. Usually fighting from horseback, the Blood Dragons sometimes fought on foot and were masters of all forms of combat and all weapons, though they eschewed cowardly ranged weapons and magic in favor of pure physical strength and martial skills, believing only in that which was physical. However, they were not above using magic and would sometimes use their innate, though poorly developed, abilities in necromancy to raise undead servants. Blood Dragon Vampires were one of the most well-disguised bloodlines in the old world, for in the war-torn world, the vampires could easily hide among knightly orders or distant outposts feeding on those they could to avoid detection while using their disguise and opportunities for battle to test their skills and push themselves, living only for combat, the attainment of honor, and the thrill of battle, a dark parody of the virtue of mortal knights. Ever seeking to emulate their progenitor, Aborash, Blood Dragon Vampires were as much a scourge upon the world as any other vampire. Though they claimed to be honorable and sometimes spared those they fought, they were no friends of humanity in the old world and would readily kill those they deemed weak or without honor. Though each vampire had a different code and some were more merciful than others. Many years ago, the people of the Empire would have named the Knights of the Order of the Blood Dragon amongst the noblest and most virtuous warriors defending their lands. Their great fortress, Blood Keep, guarded the passes to Britonia and was famed for the strength of its walls and the valor of its defenders. Yet their terrible fall from the lofty heights of their noble purity into blackest darkness and corruption came not from within, but from without. One night, a man of great stature and noble bearing appeared before the gates of the fortress and demanded entrance. He named himself as Valach of the Harkon family, and when the knights opened the gates to him, they unwittingly sealed their doom. Valach challenged the knights to single combat, fighting them all with peerless skill and unnatural vigor and strength. He slew the mortal knights of Sigmar with ease, for he was a vampire who had learned his war craft in ancient days from the great and fabled Aborage, first of the Blood Dragons. Though none of the knights could hope to defeat the undead monster, Valar spared those who fought bravely and with honor, passing to them his curse of vampirism and corrupting them utterly, slaying the others without pause or mercy, and feasting on their blood. Rising from their defeat as deathless monsters, the fallen, pale-faced knights became a scourge upon the land under the leadership of their new Grand Master. Forsaking their oaths to Sigma and the people of his empire, the knights removed all objects of faith from their keep, throwing them from the walls after slaughtering their confused squires and retainers and raising them into undeath. 
They tore all sacred symbols of faith from their armor that quickly became twisted by their dark power coursing through their veins. Sallying forth in dark parody of their former selves atop nightmare steeds forged from the carcasses of their once noble charges, the bloodthirsty knights began to prey on those they had previously protected, sowing terror and death among the villages and towns they had once sworn to defend, reveling in their new power and liberation. The people who had once showered the knights with affection now lived in fear under the terrible shadow of Blood Keep, now a spirit-haunted lair of monsters, and cried out for help. The people's suffering did not go unnoticed. Many decades later, the witch hunter, Gunther van Hell, discovered the truth of the Order's fate and attacked the darkened Blood Keep with an army amassed from Wissenland and Reichland, supported by no less than four knightly orders. The siege lasted for three years, during which the bloodshed was like nothing the soldiers of the Empire had seen as they faced the fallen champions they had once counted as brothers. Their noble features twisted in psychotic bloodlust as their eyes glowed like hellfire. Many a time, the knights charged out from the gates of their fortress, crashing into the ranks of the Imperial Army and slaughtering hundreds with each devastating attack. Yet the resolve of the Imperial troops was unbreakable, and they fought with determination against the twisted vampires, slaying many of the monstrous warriors. Eventually, the Imperial troops managed to storm the castle, and the Knights of Blood Keep, unable to resist the onslaught of the vast army, were slain or scattered throughout the wilds, hunted by the vengeful soldiers and Van Hell for years. Following the siege, Blood Keep fell into ruin, and its evil masters passed into myth. However, though the knights that once called Blood Keep their home may have been defeated, they were not destroyed. Some escaped retribution, scattering across the lands of the Empire, Bretonia, Talia, and further afield. Accomplished with lance and sword, these fell warriors became dark mercenaries, solitary duelists, and fearsome raiders. Yet many centuries after the fall of Blood Keep and the demise of their order, whispers and rumors abound that Blood Keep was inhabited once more. Those who lived near the mountains spoke of nocturnal hunters troubling the dwarven holes. Gossip mongers claimed that immortal knights once again feasted on human blood in the ancient, dusty halls, and skeletal sentries patrol the ramparts. Some said that Valach had returned, and that he had gathered his forces to wage war upon those who had tried to destroy him. And now onto their appearance. The Knights of the Blood Keep are a macabre, horrific parody of the virtuous Templars that Valach corrupted. Blood Dragon vampires that hail from elsewhere than Blood Keep are equally twisted, many being one's prodigal sons or daughters, the prides of their families or realms fallen, quite tragically into darkness, their shining armor befouled, and their names dashed from records, forsaken by the light and their people as they forsook their own oaths. 
Many of these knights wear custom-made armor crafted by the finest artisans by commission, sometimes wearing the heraldry they bore in their mortal lives. And though many hide among human knights and maintain an illusion of mortality, many are also desolate, hermetic fiends who stalk the wilds or dwell in caves, training almost constantly. Though the Knights of Blood Keep retain the image of the dragon as their symbol, it is only the remnant of their former selves. Their armor is encrusted with terrifying images of death and slaughter. Their blades are fell weapons inscribed with dark runes, chased with precious metals and fashioned in the likeness of evil beasts. The blazons and crests of blood keep take the shape of dragons and dragon wings. The knights do not ride flesh and blood horses, but charge into battle upon evil nightmares, with fiery eyes and footed breath, clad in thick barding painted with disturbing icons of necromantic power. The most legendary of all blood dragons was and is their first master, the Dragon Slayer, the Scourge of the Greenskins, the Blade Immortal, the Lord of Blood, Aborash the Great, Aborash the Wanderer, and Aborash the Master. But his location is unknown. Some say he wandered north, deep into the Chaos Wastes, or east into the lands of the Giants to seek out even greater conquests. Others say he followed the path of Sigma and became a god. Others say he still walks amongst their ranks in the disguise of a young thrall, watching for the most worthy amongst them. Still others think of the tales of other dragon slayers, like the mighty Gilles Le Breton and Lord Amara of Hoeth, and wonder how many faces their master might wear in a life as long as his. Whatever the case, none have seen or spoken to him in centuries, and his location and his plans remain mysterious. Harking back to the ancient days of Nehekara, at the peak of its power, in the city of Lahmia, a warrior known as Aborash dwelt. He was the protector of Lahmia's queen, Neverada, and had sworn always to uphold her honor and defend the kingdom from any threat, commanding the queen's personal bodyguard as their captain. He was a peerless swordsman, even in those days, and ancient scrolls found in the sandy ruins told of his legendary skill and loyalty, his heart filled with love for his people, but with an even greater love for his queen. When Neferata discovered the dark art of necromancy from the books of Nagash, and recreated an imperfect version of the great necromancer's potion of immortality, she became the first vampire. Gifting the rest of her court with her dark gift, she took a liking to Aborash, who she saw as a pure and noble man that she could corrupt. Drawing him in with her supernatural allure, she made false promises of love and devotion, enchanting his mind and tricking him into drinking her befouled blood. Tainted with vampirism and much to his horror, Aborash soon began to thirst for living blood, much to the amusement of his queen. 
he refused to feed upon those he had sworn to protect. So great was his martial pride. Yet his resistance was short-lived, for he could not resist the powerful thirst for blood that had overtaken him. In a night of gory feasting, the captain of the guard slaughtered a dozen of the queen's subjects and drank their blood, sullying his purity and damning himself forevermore. Filled with sorrow and guilt over what he had done, Abarash swore to never again drink the blood of innocence, and every night henceforth he lit a dozen candles in memory of those he had killed, and only drank the blood of criminals and enemies of Lahmia. When the city was besieged by the priest kings who sought to end the threat of Mangash's legacy once and for all, Aborash was at the forefront of its defense, standing with the mortal soldiers of Lahmia in battle. Ancient hieroglyphs asserted that Aborash slew hundreds of the priest king's warriors until the steps of the palace were awash with blood. Despite his best efforts, however, the city fell, though he did not join Nagash when the other vampires fled to Nagashizar, but instead chose to exile himself, followed by his zealous vampire disciples. Believing he had been betrayed not only by the mortal priest kings who had slain all those he had loved and protected, but also by his queen, who had made him what he had become, and who had fled to serve Nagash and forsaken her people. Abarash swore an oath to never again trust mortals. He continued to light the twelve candles, though they represented his hatred for humanity instead of his sorrow for those he had killed. Rather than seeking dominion over the land or knowledge of arcane arts as the other vampires did, Aborash directed his powers towards attaining the absolute pinnacle of martial achievement, striving to become the ultimate perfect warrior. He taught his followers, among whom were Valachar Khan and Varasan the Blade, that single combat and honor in battle were the only true measure of greatness, and told them that only the impure fed upon the weak. Aborash himself refused outright to feed upon those he deemed weak, and contented himself only with the blood of tribal chiefs and other great fighters, traveling far and wide in pursuit of this goal. He sought out the most lauded warriors and slew countless orc warlords, human tribal leaders, champions of chaos, and other great fighters. None, however, could match him. His Ascension and Legacy Eventually, Aborash's quest took him to a mighty peak in the World's Edge Mountains, its summit wreathed in fire and smoke. He scaled the daunting edifice in a single day, and came upon the lair of an ancient and immense Red Dragon. Knowing then that he had found the challenge he had been seeking, he drew his sword and dared to enter the lair of the beast. The vampire and the dragon threw themselves at each other. The monster's breath bathed Aborash in flames, but his immortal flesh did not char. Its claws and fangs tore rents in his shield and armor, while Aborash's sword cleaved immense gashes into the thick hide of the dragon. They battled for the whole night, and the mountains echoed with the fierceness of the clash. Just before daybreak, 
His sword found the dragon's heart, and he dealt it a final, fatal blow. Even as the last of the dragon's life bubbled from the wound, he bared his fangs and burrowed his head into the gaping cut, gulping deeply at the lifeblood of the dragon. He drank and drank, filling himself with the dragon's life force. He cast the monstrous beast's bloodless carcass from the mountain top and gave a roar of victory that caused avalanches to tumble for many miles around. Invigorated by the blood of the dragon, infused with its ancient strength, Aborash no longer thirsted for the blood of humans. Finally, after centuries of torment, he had freed himself from the blighted on life Neferata had cursed him with. At one point, Gilles Le Breton and his grail companions came across him. The two mighty warriors dueled, resulting in the blood knights swearing an oath of fealty to Gilles and his people. The vampire later assisted with the construction of La Maisontale Abbey as part of his life debt. Good. I spit on good. I desire only power, and you watch, for I shall have it. The Red Duke, also known as the Scourge of Aquitaine, the Northern Sword, and El Sif by the Arabians, was a former Bretonian Duke of Aquitaine during his mortal life, who was later transformed into a mighty Blood Knight. A mighty warrior and peerless swordsman, the Duke of Aquitaine was a renowned hero of Bretonia famed across the land as the slayer of the dragon, Nerluc. His skills were such that he made it a practice that any man of any station, noble or peasant, might cross swords with him at any hour. If they could but scratch him, a purse of gold would belong to the challenger. Many came to test the duke, but the purse of gold was never claimed. However, the Duke was not just a mighty warrior, but an honorable and selfless leader of men. He would often set out on perilous quests, coming to the aids of lands and dukedoms that were not his own. He had campaigned alongside Duke Chararic against the orcs that had raided his lands along the river Grismerie and joined Duke Arnulf to hunt down the great dragon, Gundowald. He had even spent an entire month within the Lyonian court of Duke Balomer, lending them his wisdom. He gazed out across the band of warriors, knights from Royal Couronne and Fey-haunted Kennel. From the mountain reaches of Montfort and the wind-swept coast of Lyonnais, from the dark forests of Artois and the verdant plains of his own Aquitaine, foreign knights from every corner of the empire looked upon the Bretonian duke with the same expectant, longing expression as the men of his own land. Even the dusky Talian mercenaries, sell-sword adventurers who joined the crusade not to free Estalia and Araby from a wicked tyrant, but from the promise of plunder. Even these honorless soldiers looked to the Duke for hope and guidance. By the year 1449 IC, the Duke had become known as El Sif Ashamel, for the Arabians had named him, in the crude dialect of their nomadic tribes, the Northern Sword, often shorted simply to El Sif, the Sword. It was a title he had earned through a year of bloody fighting to liberate the kingdoms of Estalia from the Sultan Jafar, 
It was a name the Arabians had come to whisper in terror after the Bretonian armies came to the deserts of Araby to take the crusade into the Sultan's own lands. Fighting alongside his king in the scorching deserts of Araby, the Duke gained further renown as the hero of the Siege of Lashik and proved instrumental in the destruction of Jafar's heathen empire. Alas, while returning from this great victory, the Duke was assailed by a horde of Arabian assassins. They were led by a traitorous knight, one of several who hoped to usurp his dukedom. El Sith made for a grim sight in his final moments. Surrounded as he was by the barren sand dunes, the raiders had chosen to hide their ambush. He was encased in full battle dress, every inch of him sheathed in steel armor, which had been made bare after an Arabian blade slashed his surcoat. The plate mail was rendered in the finest Bretonian fashion, each piece of armor richly engraved, the edges gilded. Indeed, El Sef had always maintained that death should be grandly appointed when it came for a man, and he ensured that those who fell in battle against him would know their slayer was no simple yeoman or knight of the realm. Alas, though he slew each and every Arabian who stood before him, the Duke fell to a poison-laced wound. But he did not truly perish, for a long figure had been watching the Duke's desperate battle and was greatly impressed by the Bretonian skill and valor, revealing himself as Aborage, ancestor of the Blood Dragons. He granted the dying knight the Blood Kiss. The warrior spirit inside you will fight to survive, even if your mind begs for death. Even for one who has lived since the days of al Qadizar and Lahmizash, I have seldom seen a warrior with a greater affinity for the sword. You were destined to ascend from the frailty of mortal flesh and become something greater to become the Get of Aborage. Falling mortally ill, El Sith was taken back to his realm by his loyal knights, there to die in bed of the three knights. Mourning the loss of their beloved duke, the people buried him in a tomb fit for a king. However, this was not the end for the Northern Sword. Three nights later, the door of the tomb opened, and out stepped the Duke, reborn as a dread vampire, transformed completely in both mind and body. The monster immediately set about attacking and killing those he had protected, starting with those who had betrayed him and usurped his dukedom, drawing to him knights from all across his realm who sought to emulate his warcraft as he raised deathless legions with his newfound powers. As the reputation of the fell warrior spread, King Louis, his brother, immediately raised an army to stop him. In a great battle at Serran Field, the Red Duke encountered his younger sibling. Seeing the king fighting alone against enemies on all sides, the vampire commanded his minions to cease their efforts against Louis, parting into a clear path between him and his prey. The Duke announced to Louis that he had betrayed him, that he could not be content as king, but had to become Duke of Aquitaine as well. With that, the final chapter of what would become known as the Battle of Serran Field began. The Red Duke charged the Grail Knight, 
born atop a spectral steed of bone and witch fire. Its corruption swathed in a black caparison and lowered his lance. A barbed thorn of steel soaked in the blood of Bretonian knights. The scourge of Aquitaine was one of the mightiest blood knights since Aborage himself. But even he could not stand against the Lady's wrath. Blinded by the holy light surrounding Louis, his heart was pierced by the blessed lance, skewering his body and lifting him from his saddle. The duke looked down from atop the lance towards his brother. His skin blackened and withered, and blood filled his eyes as he let out a final horrific moan. With the undead army destroyed and their leader defeated, Britonia rejoiced in its victory. However, the grief-stricken Louis refused to believe that his brother could rise again, and did not want to destroy his body out of respect for the man he had once been. Despite the pleas of the priestesses of the lady, and even his own lords, the king's will was law. The body of the Red Duke was not consigned to the flames, as had first been ordered, but was instead born from the field of battle. A great tower of marble was erected upon the hill overlooking Serran Field, and into this pillar the vampire's body was placed. A bronze statue depicting the Duke of Aquitaine at the height of his heroic glory was set atop the pillar and rich engravings chronicle the life of the noble warrior before he had descended into darkness. A prophetess, Isabeau, had warned against honoring a thing that had turned to evil and visited such wickedness upon the land, but her words fell upon unheeding ears. The king's grief was great. Only by praying tribute to his dead enemy could he ease the burden of his heart. The prophetess did prevail upon the king to allow her to place enchantments upon the monument spells that would protect the tomb and hold it inviolate against all manner of evil. Her spells would safeguard the tomb from the ravages of wind and rain, but they would also protect the land from that which lay within the tomb. In the darkness of the first night, after the tomb was magically sealed, Something stirred within the marble pillar. Something engorged by the darkest of magic. Something that ripped the broken lance from its heart. Something that sneered at the foolish compassion that had prevented King Louis from destroying its body. The king would suffer for his mistake. All Britonia would suffer. Then the vampire attempted to leave his tomb. An unseen power drove him back. He found it impossible to even approach the walls of his crypt, repulsed by the enchantments that saturated the marble column. The Red Duke could only turn within the small interior of his prison and curse at the walls that confined him. The walls he couldn't even touch. Alone in the eternal darkness of his own tomb, the Red Duke passed the long years, tormented by the bloodlust that consumed his corrupt body. Hour by hour, his ravenous hunger swelled, torturing him with pangs of longing he was powerless to satisfy. Vainly, he cast his thoughts upon the past, trying to forget his hunger by reflecting upon his deeds, losing himself in moments heroic and infamous with equal abandon. Almost five centuries later, 
on a fateful night. A cabal of witches and corrupt nobles wish to evoke the warrior spirit of the Red Duke, hoping to channel his martial prowess into a chosen vassal for their own dark purposes. They broke the seal surrounding the tomb and unintentionally released the Red Duke back into the world once more. However, his time and tomb without any blood to nourish him had driven the already viciously eccentric vampire completely insane. In his madness, the Red Duke fought a bizarre campaign, recreating the war that led to his defeat at Serran Field and the Crusade in Araby. Though King Louis had long since passed away, the Red Duke ignored the words of his saner associates and led his forces across the land. The mad vampire slaughtered his enemies, even if he did not recognize them for who they were, but imagined them as opponents from ages past, both at home and abroad. The Red Duke led his army once again to Serran Field to defile the tomb of the Grail Knight, Galant, who had become legendary during the Duke's imprisonment. Here, he battled against the incumbent Duke of Aquitaine, Gillon, who he saw as the usurper of his dukedom. Though he killed the aging noble in a fierce duel, he was badly injured in turn. When he finally entered the Grail Knight's tomb, the Duke was confronted with the maddening truth of his legacy. Not only was Gillon one of his descendants, but Galant was his own son. This drove the Vampire Lord screaming from the battlefield, leaving his army in ruins. Riding into the wilderness, the Red Duke was pursued by many brave knights, but never discovered. Many different tales are still told of his whereabouts, stories that he continues to haunt the forest of Chalon, lurking hidden in the shadows, awaiting his chance for revenge against the people of Aquitaine. Witness the armor of black, the unraised visor, the iron-clad fist that rules from the shadows. Yes, darkness is abroad, from the city of the damned to the hovels of the wretched. Moussillon is lost indeed, and if you seek to find it, traveler, you will find only death. Malobord, also known as the Serpent, or the Black Knight, was a mysterious figure who appointed himself Duke of Moussillon and later attempted to claim the crown of Britonia, riding into war as a ferocious Blood Knight. None know for sure the true identity of the knight now known as Malobod. Although rumors persist that he is the bastard son of King Luan Leoncar himself. Whatever his origins, Malobod was certainly once a dashing and heroic knight, one of the finest young lances in Britonia. He was, and still certainly is, both a magnificent warrior and a man whose honor and principles were bound in iron. It is told that after setting off to fight in the Border Princes, returning as the only member of his war band left alive, Malobord earned his spurs and was confirmed as a full Knight of the Realm. However, such was his devotion to the knightly code that he immediately renounced his lance and rode out as a questing knight, seeking the blessing of the lady and a revelation from the grail about what purposes his life should serve. 
He rode out all across Britonia, devoting himself to the life of denial and toil demanded of a questing knight. Again, he seemed content to allow rumors to fly among Moussillon's nobles about his deeds as a questing knight. It is said he rode through the Massif Orcal and cleansed whole valleys of the green skins, battled bat-winged harpies in the grey mountains, and stemmed the advance of an entire goblin tribe at Axebite Pass. Other tales have him rooting out a chaos cult among the foreign merchants in Longui and hunting down the monstrous blue hag of the forest of Chalon. One of the most persistent stories relates how Malobod, after long years of questing for the Grail, became weary of his hardships and finally came to rest at a Grail chapel. The Grail Damsel welcomed him in, but Malobod was grim-faced and angry. Why had the Lady forsaken him? Had he not done enough for her? Why had the Lady forsaken him? Had he not done enough for her? Had he not slain Bretonia's monsters, sought to help its innocents, and punish its wicked? Yet why had he seen no sign of the Grail? and received no message from the lady. He railed in anger that he should devote his life to the quest and yet gain nothing from it. The Grail Damsel had counseled many questing knights, and she answered him as she had all those others. The quest for the Grail, she told Malabord, is not a journey undertaken to gain recognition from the lady, or a trial to earn the right to drink from the Grail. The true quest is for the knight to reach this point, the point of despair, and then carry on with the quest in spite of it. This is the true test of a knight, not the strength of his sword arm, but the strength of his soul. Not whether he can slay a forest full of monsters, but whether he can come to understand that he may never sip from the grail and yet still continue to seek it. Malobod thought on this. If it was true, then surely all he had to do was to carry on, to pit himself against the most terrible threats and meet them with passion and valor and eventually the lady would come to him as she had promised. With the dawn, he rode out from the Grail Chapel and did not rest until he came to the very place where his despair would be tested, to the land of despair itself, to Moussillon. There, he certainly found enough of it. It is almost certain it was Mullerbord who rode out against a host of the undead who had gathered near the orphan hills and who delved into the caves beneath the ruined bridge at Point Résolu to bring the nefarious rat men to the sword. None can say what other adventures he had in the lost duchy. As he himself tells it, he eventually came to rest on the edge of the forest of Ardon. Through seeking beastmen and other monsters, he instead came across a foul, brackish creek. As he watched its grey-green sheen lifted and the clouds of flies lifted to reveal a clear, beautiful lake wreathed in chill mists, a hand reached up from the waters bearing a shining golden chalice, and Malobod knew he had at last found the Grail. Drinking from it could have only two outcomes. If he had any taint of sin in his heart, the magic of the Grail would kill him instantly. If, however, he was pure as a true knight should be, then he would be given the blessing of the lady. Never know fear again, 
and ride back into civilization as a hollowed Grail Knight. He took the Grail, confident his years of questing must have cleansed him of any taint. He drank of its waters, and when he was not struck dead, he realized that he must have passed the test, and that the blessing of the lady was upon him. And then he saw the truth. The Grail had no effect on him. Malobod did not die, nor did he become a Grail Knight. Instead, he received a revelation about the Lady of the Lake, the knightly code, and all that is at the very heart of Bretonian chivalry. Somehow, instead of becoming a Grail Knight, he had glimpsed past the Lady's magic and seen the truth behind her. Or, perhaps, some madness struck him, and he saw a fevered hallucination brought about by his exposure to the misery of Moussillon. Whatever the case, Malobord believed it to be the truth, and it was terrible indeed. Moussillon was once ruled by a just and even-handed ruler. Yet no more. Now the land is blighted, forsaken by the light, and all but the most stalwart residents. Death stalks Moussillon, and they call him my lord. From Petrus Stavehard, an official scribe of the Holy Order of the Templars of Sigma. Only Malobod's closest co-conspirators know what he saw when he drank from the grail. It was devastating enough for him to cast aside all that was knightly and curse the name of the lady. He rode, desolate, back into Moussillon with everything he had ever believed in, in tatters seeking only death in the land of despair. But he did not find death. Instead, his sorrow turned to anger, and his anger into hatred. He had been lied to since the day he was born, and worse, he had lived that lie. But he could do something about it. If he overthrew the crown of Britonia and abolished the worship of the Lady of the Lake, he could put right the wrong that had been done to Britonia. But to do that, he first needed to gather an army and challenge for a dukedom, so that he could eventually seek out the throne of Britonia for himself. It was an insanely ambitious plan one that required Malobod to be the first man to usurp the throne of Britonia. But the same dedication that had seen him seek out the Grail and quest on through his despair was now turned towards his crusade against the Lady of the Lake and the Crown of Britonia. His plan is in its early stages. He has explained his terrible vision to several of Moussillon's nobles, and many have joined with him. Some of them share his outrage at the lie that has been perpetrated, while others are simply bitter, wicked men who want revenge against Britonia for making them outcasts. These nobles have pledged their resources to the first of Malobod's objectives, a claim to the dukedom of Moussillon itself. Their armed forces are needed both to fend off a possible challenge from the king and to enable an armed expedition to reclaim the ducal palace. The expedition is imminent and it will not be long before he strides into the halls where Muldred and Malfleur met their end. 
His plan relies on his creating an alliance of often wicked and treacherous men and women using only the force of his personality. Fortunately for him, he possesses a charisma and persuasiveness that is the equal of any true Grail Knight. Though the truth that he believes about Britonia is outlandish and frankly difficult to believe, Malobot states it with such conviction that many who have heard it have believed him completely. He is gracious and generous to his allies, and even offers enemy nobles a single chance to join him. He is also still an extremely honor-bound knight, and has never executed a fellow noble. Instead, he gives them a chance to survive through single combat with him. In truth, this is not much of a chance, as he is one of the most skillful warriors ever born in Bretonian chivalry. But the idea of slaughtering a nobleman like an animal is still unacceptable to Malobord. He is, however, utterly ruthless at his core. He shows commoners and foreigners none of the comparative leniency he affords Bretonian nobles. He has had countless peasants, mercenaries, or foreign adventurers executed and worse. He also has such conviction in his cause that he is willing to send brave men, even nobles, to their certain deaths if it is the furtherance of his aims. Also, though Malobord is bound by his own sense of honor, he has abandoned the knightly code completely, having openly refused the grace of the lady and the authority of the king. Such unknightly pursuits as employing mercenaries or black powder war machines hold no shame for him. Most sinisterly, Malobord's devotion to his cause has even eclipsed his basic sense of right and wrong. It is said that the walking dead answer to his call, and that should the king invade Moussillon, the living will march alongside the dead in his army. Some of the nobles with whom Malobor deals have the vilest reputations as necromancers, witches, and even blood-drinking fiends, and yet he courts them all, caring only whether they can help him in furthering his aims. He is rarely seen in Moussillon, and does not seem to have a single base of operations. Instead, he patronizes the courts of the nobles who support him, both helping them recruit and deploy their forces, and presumably checking upon them to ensure their loyalty. He wears full black armor, earning him the nickname of the Black Knight, and never raises his visor unless he is in the company of fellow noble conspirators. It is said he is a handsome but very intense man, who seems as ageless and inscrutable as a true Grail Knight, and his deep, sonorous voice can convince a man of the most terrible things. His heraldry is a yellow serpent on a black field, and it is displayed proudly both on his own shield and barding and on that of the select band of knights who form his personal troops. This is the standard that many are certain will soon be flying on the walls of the barony. By the year 1539, or 2517 IC, Rumors had spread throughout Britonia of an accursed army gathering in Moussillon, led by a mysterious knight clad in black. Malobord's army did not want for soldiers, as disgraced knights and vile cutthroats flocked to his banners. From among the most loyal and skillful of these ruthless warriors, he formed his personal retinue, the knights of the Black Grail. Backed 
by an ever-growing army, Molobord commandeered the ancient city of Musillon and raised the banners of the serpent above its walls. The Black Knight then proclaimed himself the rightful Duke of Musillon. I awoke to find Moussillon, a pale shadow of its glorious past, overrun with vermin, its lands annexed by its neighbors, its very name a byword for despair and failure. But now I have returned. Now Moussillon will rise again, and you, my brothers, will rise with it. Duke Merovech of Moussillon, also known as Merovech the Mad, Merovech the Butcher, the Dark Lord of Moussillon, and formerly the Saviour of Bretonia, was the bloody-handed ruler of Moussillon, a fearsome warrior and strong leader his desperation to restore the glory of his dukedom would lead him to become an extremely powerful blood knight, feared throughout Britannia for his bloodlust. Around 1813 IC, the Red Pox swept through the fair lands of Britannia, killing many of its inhabitants. In that time, Merovech was Duke of Moussillon, and a proud warrior looking with envy upon the glory days of the realm, during the reign of the mighty Landuin, first Duke of Moussillon, and greatest of the Grail Companions. He was desperate to restore the prestige that his city had in those distant times. With honorable intentions, but led astray by corrupt advisers, Merovech set upon the path of dark powers. Thus it came that when the plague struck, the duke and his knights remained unaffected. Seeing his chance for glory, he mustered his men and rode out against the vile rat men who beset the lands of Bretonia. He rode south, broke the siege of Brion, believing he was Landuin reborn. He followed the same route as Gilles Le Breton and his grail companions had taken, and headed east to Athaloran. He relieved Canel from a siege at the edge of the enchanted forest. He met with the armies of Paravon and the Fey folk and battled the Skaven. A great victory was won, and the rat creatures scattered before the martial might of Merovech and his most trusted knights. In the middle of the battle, he was soaked in blood, reveling in the killing. Even after his foe lay unmoving, still he continued to hack at them with his gore-soaked blade. The virtuous and honorable knights of Paravon looked on in horror. All were invited to celebrate the victory upon the Skaven with a great banquet in the halls of Moussillon Castle. However, the guests were most horrified by what they saw. Dinner was served by shambling Corpse-like servants and spitted and impaled criminals were set around the hall. Merovech, drunk and feeling ill-appreciated, claimed to be dishonored. The king expressed his revulsion at what he saw, upon which Merovech accused the king of jealousy and conspiring against the savior of Britonia. The people of Moussillon tell of how the king then challenged him, refusing to let one of his dukes battle in his stead. The duel started. It was fierce, and Merovech fought like a demon. 
The two combatants clashed throughout the Great Hall until finally, with rage in his heart, Merovech tore out the king's throat. The duke then filled a goblet with the king's blood and drank from it. Many have since claimed there was no duel, that the king was simply murdered by his insane and unchivalrous subject. Regardless, upon witnessing Merovech's act of bloodthirst, the other dukes hastily retreated from Moussillon, pursued by a horde of twisted creatures and malformed peasants. The citizens of Moussillon were led to believe that despite his reputation, Merovech had been chosen to succeed the murdered king. In truth, the Fey Enchantress had already denounced him as a traitor alongside the newly crowned Royarch. Lyonnais mustered its troops and led a massive invasion of Moussillon, and many of its knights gladly took up arms against their insane ruler having no wish to be associated with her liege lord and swearing fealty to Lyonnais. Faced with the might of all Bretonia, Merovech was defeated and slain, though many brave warriors fell beneath his blade. After his demise, Lyonnais absorbed a large portion of Moussillon into their own dukedom, leaving only its most tainted lands behind. Though wildly vilified and despised, many notable knights and families owed Merovech for saving them from the Skaven armies. After his death, they banded together and in spite of the new king's wishes, built a mighty tomb for the dead duke. The huge stone mausoleum, the size of a small keep, was constructed near the center of Moussillon. After many centuries, his tomb sunk into the marshes of Moussillon and was thought lost forever. Many a questing knight set out to find the tomb, but none ever succeeded. Revenge Tonight is the dawning of a new era in Moussillon's history. Once, our realm was the most powerful in all Britonia. Now, we have a chance to reclaim that glory, you and I. Centuries passed before Merovech rose from his tomb, revealing himself to have been a powerful vampire. Restored to full potency, he towered over mortal men and moved with unnatural precision, as if his armor was a second skin. The armor he donned was of an archaic, old-fashioned style, fluted and with serrated barbs at its edges. It was of such dark steel that it was almost black and was completed by a helmet that had been forged to resemble a snarling dragon. The vampire never carried a shield, but bore a pair of unholy blades strapped at his side, encrusted with dark runes. He bore no heraldry other than a simple black fleur de lys, the ancient symbol of Moussillon. His first action upon his return was to overthrow the Vargulf leader of Moussillon, known as the Old One, imprisoning the beast and taking control of its undead followers. A sizable army began to take shape, but the duke still needed to search for a champion. Infiltrating tournaments under the guise of a noble knight of the realm, Merovech discovered two young brothers, Calar and Bertelis of Garamont. He would go on to fight Bertelis, and whilst he defeated his opponent with ease, he was greatly impressed with the young knight's potential. Merovech bided his time, 
visiting Bertelis after a series of tragic events had resulted in his brother denouncing him. The morose and bitter young knight accepted the vampire's offer to train him, eventually accepting the blood kiss. With his champion chosen, Merovech decided to seal their bond with damnation. The two blood knights traveled to Castle Garamont, where the pair slaughtered an entire garrison of knights and men at arms, drinking the blood of the slain and burning Garamont to the ground, erasing Bertelis's ties to that realm. Returning to Museon, he then summoned corrupt nobles from all across Britonia to aid his cause, and resurrected his long-dead bodyguard of elite blood knights, adding to what was becoming a fearsome army. He was now close to enacting his revenge and conquering all of Britonia. Your master's going to die, said Kalar as Bertelis closed the distance between them. I think not, said his brother. No devolved Vargulf is a match for him. Several years into the vampire's plan, Kalar of Garamont, now a questing knight, arrived within the cursed city of Moussillon. He was disguised as one of the many disgraced knights who had answered the Duke's call to war, and planned to exact revenge upon the one responsible for sacking his home. Galar's attempt to kill Merovech would not go as planned, however for he discovered Bertelis slaughtering knights with a dueling ring under the gaze of his new master. As the two brothers fought, ghouls burst into the castle, led by none other than the Old One. Kalar's arrival had allowed the Vargulf's few remaining followers to release it and launch an attack. While his undead servants fought against a tide of ghouls, Merovech entered into a mighty duel with the vampiric beast. Taking his fight to the balcony above, he danced and weaved like a dervish, ducking under blows that would have torn him in half, twin blades flashing. He moved with preternatural speed, but the monster he fought was almost as quick, despite its bulk. Soon enough, the creature was bleeding from a dozen wounds, but it did not slow. The old one caught Merovech in a glancing blow that sent the duke skittering across the ground, causing the Vargulf to roar in victory and leap after him. He recovered quickly, however, and rolled under the blade-like talons that hammered down towards him. As he came to his feet, both blades carved bloody furrows across the monster's chest, and it hissed in pain. Using the immense beast's arm like a ladder, Merovech turned and leapt lightly up his enemy's body, spinning both swords around in his hands so that they were pointed downwards, like daggers. Kicking off the beast's chest, he turned in mid-air and plunged both swords into its neck. The old one bellowed. Both swords were embedded to the hilt, their tips protruding from the back of its neck as it thrashed around in pain. It reached up and ripped both weapons free, hurling them away from it, and blood gushed from the wounds. Such a blow ought to have been fatal, but the beast merely shook its head and dropped to all fours, and began stalking towards the now unarmed Duke Merovech. 
In the chaotic battle below, Kalar, having witnessed Merovech being disarmed, briefly hoped that the Old One would be the Vampire's doom. Alas, the ancient monster was ultimately brought down, blood pooling beneath it. Its flesh was slashed and torn, hanging from it in bloody tatters. Duke Merovech stood before it then, a recovered sword in hand, as the Vargul's powerful legs bunched for one final spring. But it was never given the chance. The Blood Knight hurled his sword aside and leapt towards his enemy with a blood-curdling battle cry, hands extended like claws. He grabbed the immense creature by the head, grappling with it, and with a roar of effort, he wrenched it upwards, exposing its neck. His fangs flashed, and he tore it into the Vargul's neck. The creature fought against him, but its strength was gone. For long moments, Merovech drank, glutting himself before pulling away. Then, he dragged the immense weight of the Vargulf across the floor until he reached a distant altar. He forced its neck back and lowered his mouth to its neck once more. This time, he did not feed, but rather tore. He ripped open its throat and the last of its blood gushed forth. As he threw his foe's broken corpse onto the dueling ring below, he witnessed Bertelisa's destruction. The sudden arrival of the ghouls and their master had distracted his dark champion, allowing Kalar to pierce his brother's heart with the sword of Garamor before retreating from the castle. Merovech dropped to one knee alongside Bertelisa's ashen corpse, and something approaching sorrow ghosted across the duke's features as he placed a hand upon the fallen knight's chest. Nevertheless, he would not be set back by the death of his favored pupil. He would continue to amass his dark army and march upon the realm of Britonia, bringing vengeance with him. He could see the towering walls of Britonia's capital, pennons fluttering in a wind Kalar could not feel. Stormy skies roiled above the white towers, and battlements and lightning flashed. Tens of thousands of warriors were embroiled in desperate battle, and Kalar's eyes widened. Scores of trebuchets were firing from atop Kuron's walls, hurling great chunks of masonry into the endless horde, and the sky was dark with arrows. Thousand strong formations of knights sallied forth in glorious charges, only to be surrounded and dragged down by the endless ranks of the dead. Kala's breath caught his throat. He was witnessing the death of his nation. The Duke of Moussillon was last seen at the head of his vast army, having fought his way to the very gates of Couronne itself. He and his elite cadre of vampire knights, his seneschals, carved a swath through the Bretonian lines, butchering all who stood against them. Mounted on black warhorses with eyes that glowed like coals, they thundered forwards, smashing knights from their saddles, cutting down Britonia's finest with contemptuous ease. More knights pressed in to hold their rampage, but all fell before their murderous wrath. Faster and stronger than any mortal man, these vampire knights fought with callous ferocity. 
Their eyes were red-rimmed and savage, their slitted pupil dilating as their bloodlust surged. They struck with such force that shields shattered beneath their axes and blades. Their lances punched straight through armored breastplates, lifting warriors from the saddle and tossing them aside like children. Merovech fought like a demon, lips pulled back to expose his elongated canines. Blood splattered across his snow-white face as he hacked a questing knight's head from his shoulders and thundered on, driving his heavily armored nightmare steed towards the immense gates of Kuron. He slashed left and right, killing with every stroke. The center of the Bretonian battle line buckled inwards, threatening to break at any moment. Suddenly, a shadow descended from above as King Luan Leoncourt joined the fray, mounted atop a ferocious hippogriff. For a while, the king defeated all who stood before him, but eventually, a lucky blow sent his mound crashing down, pinning him beneath its bulk. Dozens of loyal knights pushed forward, interposing themselves before their liege and the murderous vampire knights, selling their lives dearly. Merovech began to laugh as he killed the hideous sound booming out across the battlefield. The outcome of the battle balanced on a nice edge, as the fell duke hacked down the knights standing between him and the king. He slammed his sword into the standard bearer's neck, the blade biting through armor, bone, and flesh, and the royal banner fell. He loomed over his stricken foe and readied his blade. The killing blow would never land, however for Kalar of Garamon had succeeded in his quest for the Grail. Riding atop a mighty warhorse and wielding a blazing lance, the Grail Knight rushed into the battle at the head of a wood elf wild hunt. Unholy seneschals, their eyes filled with hatred, moving to interpose themselves between Kalar and their dark lord. Each was a mighty warrior and champion in their own right, but even so, they could not hope to slow the Grey Knight's furious charge. Before long, the last of the dreaded Seneschals had fallen to Kalar's holy wrath. It was then that the fell Duke of Musillon swung towards him, turning away from the fallen Bretonian king, still trapped under the weight of his massive steed. His face was the white of untouched snow, his expression arrogant and dismissive. His hair too was like alabaster, hanging down his black armored back. He held his jagged sword loosely. The blade would have taken a strong man to lift it two-handed, Yet the undead warrior drew a second blade as Kalar bore down on him, twirling the twin blades. Kalar had seen the vampire lord fight. He knew of his ungodly speed and the brutal power that was contained within him. Time seemed to slow. Galloping at full speed, Kalar saw every detail of his foe in the moment before they clashed. He saw the aristocratic disdain in Merovech's eyes, eyes that gleamed like a wolf's, reflecting back at Kalar the holy light that surrounded him. He saw the dimly glowing runes along the length of the vampire's mighty swords, and he saw each individual raindrop coming down, splashing off his enemy's fluted black armor. Kala rose in the saddle to deliver the strike. His lance, 
Elith Aina spear towards the vampire's chest. But with preternatural speed, one of Meravest's blades swung up to deflect it with an elegant circular parry. With the smallest twist of the wrist, Kalal caused the tip of his elven lance to roll around the vampire's blade, avoiding the deflection. Meravest's other blade came up, but in a display of skill and speed that surpassed even the vampire lord's abilities, Kalar again rolled his wrist, and the flaming tip of Elith Einar flicked around his second blade. The lance tip took Meravech in the throat, punching out the back of his neck in an explosion of dark blood. Kalar released his grip on the lance and continued on past the vampire as it fell to its knees. Hauling on the reins, Kalar brought his steed back around sharply. Dark blood pooled beneath the vampire, and his eyes registered the creature's shock. He tried to speak, but nothing emerged from his mouth but a splatter of blood. Kalar swung from the saddle of his warhorse and stormed towards the Duke of Musillon the sword of Garamon blazing in his hand. The vampire tore the lance from its throat and rose to meet him. Meravech had lost one of his swords, the other one he gripped in both hands. He hissed and hurled himself at Kalar. The sword of Garamon came up, smashing Meravech's sword aside. Kalar allowed his momentum to carry him around, so that he had his back turned to his enemy. With a movement so fast, it was little more than a blur, he spun his sword around so that he was holding it in a downward, dagger-like grip, left hand resting upon the pommel. He surged backwards, driving his sword into Meravech's chest. The blade slid deep, only halting when the hilt was pressed against the vampire's breastplate. It was over. The vampire's mouth opened wide in a final, soundless scream. His flesh began to wither and blacken, like parchment beneath a candle flame. Kalar wrenched his sword free, and the creature that had been Meravech fell to the ground, collapsing to grave dust. The entire army of the dead dropped, the dark magic binding and animating them dissipating. The rain ceased, and a howling wind began to clear the sky. Night slept forward to aid the king while others, bloodied and battle-weary, gazed around them blankly, not yet comprehending that the battle was finally over. Merovech, Vampire Duke of Musillon, was no more.